goodness. I had the opportunity in 1967 to pick any school I wanted to go to as an undergraduate in the state of Colorado. I had been awarded a Betcher scholarship, and many of the listeners might know it's a terrific opportunity funded by the Betcher Foundation to allow Colorado residents really go to any school in the state. Now, with that opportunity, had I gotten some good career counseling in high school, I may have chosen a university for academic reasons, but I didn't. I decided to go to Colorado State University because most of my friends from uh, my high school group were coming to CSU, and I thought that would be um, something that would make the experience much more enjoyable and maybe safer in a way. So I decided to come to CSU. I chose a degree that CSU offered and um, have had wonderful opportunities since that freshman year in 1967. I decided to uh, major in mathematics not because I necessarily loved mathematics, but I was good in math, and that's how I thought you were supposed to choose a major. And also at the time, I was becoming interested in computer science. Um, computers were new on the horizon at that point in time, and the math department hosted the computer science option. So at that point, um, I chose a math major, and then some interesting things began to happen here at CSU for me. Um, I realized that I wasn't a terrifically good fit for math, but at the same token wasn't looking for a different major. Um, but spring of my junior year, I think, I needed a five credit class. We were on the quarter system at the time, and um, I needed five credits in the afternoon so I could get out and sunbathe by, I think it was two o'clock. And not a good reason to pick a class, but it was serendipitous and it absolutely set me on a different life course. I had um, the opportunity to take a child development class for that reason and it was taught by an incredibly wonderful teacher by the name of Dr. Judy Kuypers, who is no longer in the Human Development Department. She went on to do wonderful things at other universities. But I, I took that child development class, and I realized within a few weeks into that quarter, I was not doing well, and I was not used to not doing well in school. So I was commiserating with a good friend of mine, and um, Richard thankfully said, you have to go talk to Dr. Kuypers. And that had never occurred to me. I had never talked to a math teacher, so I hadn't thought I could go talk to an instructor. He picked up the phone, he handed me the phone, and Richard said, you talk to her and make an office appointment, which I did. And I went in and said, I'm really struggling with the class, and I think it's for a very curious reason. I'm a math major, and math majors have answers. You keep talking about individual differences, and I don't know how to cope with individual differences. I want equations, and I want answers. So she seemed to be fascinated by my coming in to take an elective, and she really became a mentor. And luckily for me, I had lots of electives to take my senior year, so I took human development electives, and then she suggested I come back for a master's degree. And so I earned two out of my three degrees from CSU, and um, I was in the right time at the right place um, to have an opportunity to apply for a job in the Human Development Department that was open at the time. Um, they, they, the department, had already hired one key advisor, Jill Kreutzer, and they wanted a second key advisor to carry a lot of um, the advising load. The department was ready to, was getting um, to the point where it was growing quite rapidly, and they just wanted more student support. So it was um, a temporary position, as I recall. I was hired for the year, and um, when a full-time, more permanent position opened up, 
Bruce Gardner, who was the head at the time, suggested that Jill and I both apply for the two open jobs. Um, much more funding had come available from the state in, in the mid-70s, and the department was starting to grow very rapidly. So I became a faculty member in what was then child development and um, have spent most of the rest, the rest of my life, not most of the rest, the rest of my life at Colorado State University. So I was hired as a faculty member in uh, what became Human Development and Family Studies, went through the academic ranks, but then I um, stepped out of a full-time faculty role and into administration fairly early. I think it was about 19... 85 or so that I went into administration and I had the opportunity to apply for an assistant dean's job in what was then home economics, became human resource sciences, became applied human sciences in terms of colleges and then the role switched from an assistant dean to an associate dean role and in all those years and all the transitions in college name and role, I had the opportunity to work with some incredible mentors um, who were in the dean's role at the time. I was their assistant or their associate. Um, Helen McHugh hired me. Then I had the chance to work with Brad Schaefer as the interim dean when the two colleges merged. And then um, Ellie Guilfoyle, who became provost, was one of the deans I worked for. And then after my being interim dean for two years, after Ellie stepped into the provost role, we hired Nancy Hartley, who has given such good leadership to the college over the years. So if I had a steady job on campus, it was probably being associate dean of the College of Applied Human Sciences. It was a role I loved. And in that role, I started getting some very curious invitations from departments in the college. Um, I'll never forget a uh, summer's afternoon walking out in the, to the Oval with Nancy, and she, she said something like, you'll never guess what phone call I just got. And it turned out that a faculty group in construction, what was industrial sciences, is now construction management, asked, um, if I would consider becoming the interim department head of industrial sciences because John Sutton had left rather um, unexpectedly for another job. So I went over for what I thought was a one-year stint, became a two-year stint in that department serving as interim department head. I went back to being associate dean for a couple of years when that ended, and then Nancy said, well, got another interesting call. The faculty in design and merchandising would like you to come substitute while Antigone Katsiopoulos was on leave. So I thought, well, I had a good time in industrial sciences. Why not go to design and merchandising? So I went um, to that department for what was supposed to be a year, became a two-year stint, went back to being associate dean, and then a couple years after that, um, I got a call from the provost's office from then provost Peter Nichols. And the request was, uh, would I come over and be the interim vice provost for undergraduate studies um, while a search was launched for the permanent role? So I stepped into that role and then um, was given the permanent role of vice provost of undergraduate studies. So three years into that, I chose to retire my regular faculty administrative position. I'd been um, a faculty member for 31 years. My colleagues were retiring. I wanted more time to spend with family, and I thought, you bet. Let's um, go ahead and retire just because I can, and there are other things to do. So I remember going in, announcing to Council of Deans one day, in like February that I was gonna retire at the end of June of that year. And about two or three weeks later, my assistant, Evelyn Grace said, well, Rick Simpson, who is the head of continuing education, called and said he'd like to have lunch with you. And she goes, why would he want to have lunch with you? And I 
thought, well, I don't know, maybe he just wants to take me out for lunch. Well, there is no such thing as a free lunch, it turns out. What he was suggesting was that I get involved with another person in continuing ed on his team, Gene Morganwick, to write a grant proposal for an Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. The Bernard Osher Foundation was funding these lifelong learning institutes across the nation. Um, the target population was um, ages 50 and better. And so Gene and I wrote the grant. We were funded in 2006, I believe, and we've been offering classes ever since. So I've been co-directing that institute with Gene and thought that would be how I would finish my involvement with CSU. And then about a year and a half ago, I was out with Nancy having dinner. Nancy Hartley, I should be suspicious of that woman. And she said something like, well, the School of Education um, is looking for a new head. And I thought, oh, she's gonna ask me to chair the search committee. And instead she said, while the search is going on, they want you to come over and be the interim director of the School of Education. And I'm going, oh my goodness. But I couldn't turn Nancy down, and I'm always up for an adventure, and I think doors open because they're supposed to. So I said, oh, certainly. So I had a great year being back on campus, um, working with education colleagues, and being in a building with students again. I had missed that in some of my later roles. Um, so then that ended in July 2012, and I'm back to being the co-director of the Osher Institute. It's been a long, circuitous journey, and it's been a wonderful one. I think I grew a great deal because of wonderful mentoring and collegial relationships where I always felt like I got a great deal of support. But one of the things that I think is most important, whether it's leadership in a visionary way or managerial in a way just to make sure the operations move forward, is to work well with um, those you interact with and respect them and enjoy them. And um, one of the things that I think made a difference for me across campus was really building a network, not because I needed to um, or thought I needed to for the job, but because I wanted to. And it turns out having built that network really worked to my advantage because when um, I needed to bounce ideas off of someone or when I needed to help um, a unit get something done or wanted to implement an idea I had as an advisor or faculty member, it was great to be able to pick up the phone um, and talk to people across the college and really across the university, both the academic and the student affairs sector. So I think building a base of contacts and colleagues really made a difference. I think um, setting out to be collaborative rather than, oh good, I've got a particular title, I have more power than you do, so I win. I find that a ridiculous strategy to move any unit or a university forward and always tried to work with um, a group knowing that there is typically, not always in my mind, but typically a better solution if a lot of voices have been in the room and that there have been some disagreements so that we can listen to another and find the very best solution. So I think trying to collaborate, um, knowing that you don't have to win, and I had an interesting conversation with a young colleague a few years ago, and it was almost as if she thought one got more power by being forceful and saying it is my power rather than, oh no, power comes from everybody sharing in it because then they want you to succeed and will help you succeed because they were a part of the new direction or the solution. I do find that language is a very, very powerful tool in personal interactions, but also um, interactions in fulfilling one's role. And I'll use, I think, um, the example to begin with of kind of an administrative leadership role in um, construction management. I remember going over and um, hearing the faculty there talk in a way that was very foreign to me. There were three different majors or concentrations at the time, and the faculty 
were talking about their colleagues in those other programs as if they were the other. And they would use the term they. They said this, they believe that. And I'm amazed because I know nothing about construction management, but I'm very process oriented and I'm thinking, if I can come over and the day after I arrive use the language of we, not they, why can't you? And it occurred to me they really believed they were separate entities and they really hadn't been working together. And their first retreat room that I um, was in was set up classroom style with rows so that they didn't even have to look at each other. And I'm thinking, first of all, we're going to move it so you look at each other. You become a part of a we by knowing who your colleagues are. And so it got to be such a joke with me and the faculty about we, not they. I would correct it, if that's the right word, in a faculty meeting. And one meeting, I worked with the assistant, and I got the universal not sign, like no crossing or whatever. And I had her put the word they in it and drew the line through it. It's like we are using the word we around here. It means something and you work differently with one another. So I think language is important that way. Um, the notion of saying a phrase as if it was going to close a door rather than leave the door slightly open. We've tried that before and it didn't work. And my Faculty who have been in the department a long time are quite willing to say that in faculty meetings. And the younger faculty who you hired to be a star in a particular area is going, well, I wasn't in the department then, and I think it will work. So I think shifting language just a little bit to say something like, um, it didn't work then, but the world has changed. The department has changed. The university has changed. Our colleagues have changed. It might work now, and what can we do um, to figure that out? I think language leaves a door open for um, joint solutions and possibilities, not this is my idea and forget yours. But what is the common ground here opens up a whole different discussion as compared to my way of thinking is. So language is important. No, I don't think I've ever been a been there, done that sort of person um, because there are too many things that may unfold for the good just because the context does change. And I think the reason I've been willing to take on so many different um, roles on campus is I always thought, oh good, what's this going to open up and who will the new people be? And uh, what can I learn and what can I possibly do that will benefit the department for the year or two that I'm there? And you know, so far I'm talking about administrative roles, but um, I hope we'll be talking about teaching and advising roles as well. But been there, done that, it's like, nope, why would you live in the past with what you have? master to some level when there are all these opportunities open. And you don't know what those opportunities are sometimes until you have the courage or foolishness to close a door behind you. And one example, and I learned this from good friends and colleagues, um, Peggy Short and Mickey McMillan, who taught me years ago, sometimes the right door doesn't open. If you don't close a door. For example, had I not gone, gone into Council of Deans um, seven, eight years ago and said, I am retiring and I'm excited about um, it, and Rick Simpson, who is in, in the room, would never have thought to ask me to become involved with the Osher Institute because I had to close the faculty door before I even entered his mind. And what an opportunity that became. So just step through the door when it opens. You don't know what you'll find. I think um, leaders and administrators have to say, we will somehow or another find a way to meet that goal. And sometimes some people don't wish they were on the path they were. Um, but we are all people. We are. I, I have found out that um, sometimes it's easy to think that colleagues or students live only a life centered at CSU 
And it's like, oh no, we're human beings and we've got a lot of life to us other than Colorado State University. And so I think I always did try to make room for how are you doing and how are things going and saying it a very broad way, meaning if there are things you want to talk about that aren't work related, I'd love to know about them because I can interact better if I know some of your history and some of your family and some of the things you like to do. And I think because one of my areas of passion deals with grief and loss, um, I realize that a lot of issues that people deal with in their personal lives are grief and loss oriented and that students deal with when they give up a dream and aren't succeeding and things like that. So I did try to give the personal touch and um, act humanely because that's the way I want to be treated. And um, just going back for the firm hand for a moment, Nancy Hartley told me something recently that I hadn't realized I did, but then when I started listening to myself, I thought, oh my goodness, she's right. Um, she said, when you got really frustrated or fed up that things weren't moving fast enough, not that you were demanding the direction, but fast enough or that um, people were digging in or that you felt like people were not giving you the truth and nothing but the truth, you, you would say, oh, would you just please stop it? Or would you just please cut it out? And I'm thinking, oh, I don't say that. And then I started hearing myself say it on occasion. And it's like, well, I guess it's better to give people a verbal cue that, okay, I'm getting fed up than to blow up or get angry. It's it, it just a, a better way to do it. My teaching passion in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies really did become um, a focus on grief and loss, both in terms of education, my writing, and then my community involvement with hospice and a national organization of the Association of Death Education and Counseling. And um, my interest evolved gradually and over time, and in a way that I probably didn't understand until I was asked to put the pieces together at one point in time. An early, early piece was my grandmother uh, lived with us um, for a couple of years and it was our home she was staying in when she died. And that death was very impactful to me and I knew how important it was to me um, to have people talk about my grandmother and how important she was. Um, then I had a very, very good friend, um, a roommate here at CSU, whose husband died very early of cancer. She was able to stay at home with Russ while he died because Cindy's colleagues had donated annual leave to her so she could do it. A next door neighbor died um, at about that same time and he was able to have been cared for at home. And this was a time when most people died in a hospital or a nursing home. Then I started um, listening to conversations in the Lifespan Human Development class that I was teaching. And in Lifespan Human Development, you have to talk about death and dying. Now, mind you, you only had 45 minutes to do it, but it was important. And after that lecture and discussion, I realized there was quite a group of students that would come down to the podium and say, I need to talk. And it wasn't as much about the content necessarily. Sometimes it was, but it was applied to his or her own life. And then I realized we really do need more focus on um, the last part of the lifespan, both for the person dying and the person grieving. That was going on in my mind at about the time I noticed an article in the Fort Collins newspaper that there was going to be a community meeting um, for people interested in developing hospice in Fort Collins or Larimer County. Because of my experience with people who had died and were able to stay at home, I thought, oh, this is something I think is really, really important. So I went to the community meeting and crossed paths with a woman who had been in our department as a faculty member for a year or two, Alicia Cook, but we were in different sectors of the building. For whatever reason, I decided Alicia is so different than I am, we really won't have anything in common. So I didn't go out of my way to get acquainted with Alicia. 
And uh, we went to that meeting, found out we really did share personal interests of the hospice in this community, but we also thought we should launch a death, dying, and grief class. And um, she and I still laugh about going into a curriculum meeting for human development and um, trying to convince colleagues that we wanted to create a new class focusing on death, dying, and grief, and we needed two credits. And a faculty member, I can hear it as if it was yesterday, why do you need a two-credit class to teach about an event? The next year we came back in and said, guess what, we need three credits and death is not an event. Dying and grieving are not events, they are processes and they cut across the entire lifespan. So we were granted the opportunity to teach the death and dying course. We launched it in the late 70s. Um, we were one of the first to launch a death and dying course at a university. Um, it was intended absolutely as professional pr um, preparation for human development majors, family counselors, social workers, pre-med students, um, occupational therapy students, nutrition professionals. But no matter how often we said that, many of our students were clearly taking it for personal reasons. They took the theory um, and the research and then um, shifted it to their own um, family and individual experience. Um, so at any rate, uh, Alicia and I realized we were not doing our own teaching in that arena justice because th there was not a developmental textbook on the market at the time. Um, we were using Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book on death and dying as almost everybody in the country was that was teaching a course, and the field has moved so far beyond that. And we thought, we're teaching the course in a developmental family context, we need to write a book. So we did write two editions um, of that particular textbook. And um, it is interesting, that has been long out of print, but most other books in the field now that are intended as a text have a very strong developmental theme to them. So um, my work in that arena has been just pivotal to who I am, I think. Both teaching and advising have been uh, really the reason I think that I so enjoyed my career at CSU. Um, in the early years when I was first hired in Human Development and Family Studies, I had the good fortune um, to be sharing an office with Jill Kreutzer and we shared a role of key advisor. Um, and Jill was so passionate about advising, I didn't think I had a choice. Um, I just thought it was expected for a faculty member to care deeply about um, advising. I've since learned otherwise, but Jill and I had so much good fun and good fun and satisfaction in developing different sorts of advising modules, ways to get um, faculty involved in interacting with students one on one. And um, I think advising is where I got to develop relationships with individual students in my office. Um, in the advising role, we did certainly career development sorts of things, but what is your real dream and how can we build some steps for you to get there, class or um, practica or volunteer work or whatever it might take for you. Um, and then I had the opportunity to advise to um, define the advising role much more broadly. In my associate dean role in the early years, I got to advise the um, student council group. And I still remember um, students in um, both of those kinds of advising roles. Um, when I think about my academic advising, um, one key figure was a Tamina Torre, who has become a lifelong friend. She was an advisee and turned out to be a very feisty undergraduate who called me on my test writing skills in my classes. Um, 
She has become an outstanding faculty member at another university. Um, Gail Bishop was an early advisee and she has been involved with the vet hospital over the years in the Argus Center. Um, Linda Anson, who just res uh, retired a year or two ago from a long career um, in the Poudre School District. And if that wasn't a developmental shift for me, to have one of my advisees retiring, it was um, basically shocking to me. Um, and so I, I had a number of advisees, Gay, uh, Gay Di Gregorio, who's now the um, administrator or the director of CASA was an early advisee. So I have a great deal of pride, whether I deserve any of it not, or not, in what those students have contributed um, to this community or broader. And then when I think about the student council members that we had in the early years, um, Elisa Shackleton is working for Nutrition Extension on campus and she and I do a lot with Osher. Um, other names that come to mind are Ann Vale and Linda um, Ortner and Debbie Nelson and um, incredible women who have made many, many contributions. So what a joy to advise both individuals and our student leadership groups. And I was involved for about 10 years um, with that project and I'll talk about goals and I'll talk about history and I'll talk about some of the people who um, were involved with it. Um, first of all, I need to give credit generically to the faculty on campus who developed in years prior to our launching the diversity project, a gender integration project. We directly lifted much of the model. Um, the goal of the gender integration project and then the um, more broadly defined uh, diversity project was to be aware of all the richness really that persons of different backgrounds can bring to our classrooms as students, but also what understanding diversity brings to our knowledge as a faculty member about the content area that we are to be teaching. And human development and the College of Applied Human Sciences, because we are so people-oriented and so applied in our work, really um, did need to understand differences along many different lines, whether it was race or ethnicity or gender or religion or socioeconomic status or what have you, those things make a difference in um, our research findings. We find out that we, we did find out that we only knew a small sliver of um, a field that should have been studied much more broadly because we were focusing so much on the mainstream and thinking that the majority vantage point was the right vantage point. And a little segue, but something that still is just appalling to me when I think about it, um, was that the human development class or department years and years ago taught um, a class called the culturally disadvantaged child. And it was the word disadvantaged. It's like, oh my goodness, there was a notion at the time, and books were written in this area with that title, I think, that um, indicated a belief that those who were different and those who weren't like I am, really live a disadvantaged life rather than a life that is different but as, can be as rich in many um, instances. May not be as rich in opportunities but it doesn't necessarily talk about happiness or fulfillment or satisfaction or contribution to family. So um, I think there was an understanding that we really, really did have to expand our horizons about um, variability and and such. So the goal of the Infusion Project was that we recruit faculty from, it started in Applied Human Sciences and then went more broadly to the university, a faculty or two at a time um, to bring us to a, a group of 15 or so in any given year. Those 15 made um, a contract with the university that they would take a course they were currently teaching to infuse 
an understanding and an appreciation of diversity in that particular course. We were trying to move away from, and we struggled with this concept, that many of us knew we were to do something, but we didn't know what to do. So our first strategy in the early years, before the Infusion Project launched, was, well, I think I'm going to call the people I know that are of um, different backgrounds. If I was focusing on race and ethnicity, then I would call Blanche Hughes and I would call Linda Ahuna and I would call Victor Baez who could represent represent different groups as if they were the spokesperson for those groups. And then we would have a panel and students would say, well, what is it like to be a person of your background? Never admitting to anybody that there is as much diversity within those groups, or any group, not those groups, any group, as there is homogeneity within a group. Um, but we wanted them to be the perfect example of a particular characteristic. Um, so we knew we needed to get way, away from the spotlighting diversity in our panel or our movie so that we infused it so naturally that our students almost didn't understand that we were um, doing something um, so significantly different from that, that it was just a natural discussion point. So we made sure people thought about different readings, different topics, um, challenged people in a different way. And um, so the contract was that by the end of the year they would file a new um, course outline after they had gone through a year-long educational um, experience with colleagues. We had facilitators, but the faculty in the group became as um, important a resource as the facilitators did because we could come in and say, this is what I tried and it didn't work. What did I do wrong? Does anybody have an idea of what I could try differently? So it was a really um, experimental time with people wanting to do something helpful, sometimes finding out it was hurtful, and finding we weren't using the, la the language that some would prefer we were using, um, that we were passing judgments and when we didn't even know we were passing judgment. So we created a very safe, open environment um, and embarked on a struggle that did not end the year after. Um, someone left the, the project. Many came back and shared stories and mentored and served as facilitators. But the thing that started happening was that some of the lessons we had learned collectively became so ingrained in who we are as um, faculty members that we couldn't stop with that one course we were contracted with. I remember getting a call at one point from Tony Zimmerman, who's been a longtime faculty member in human development and involved with the um, family therapy um, program. She called and said, you took advantage of me. I was supposed to. Um, infuse one class. Well, I haven't infused every class. I have made a difference in the Family Therapy Center. My research takes into account variables and research design that I didn't know to take into account earlier. So, my goodness, I um, have given the university lots more than it ever asked for in that regard, and that was exciting. And I remember getting another phone call from colleagues in design and merchandising saying, we just filled out forms to create a new um, senior seminar for the department, and we weren't thinking consciously about infusing diversity, but we looked at the course and went, my gosh, it's part of who we are. This is a course focusing on many variables and appreciation of diversity. So I think we made a difference. The project started with a USDA grant that Victor Baez and I um, applied for with support of Ellie Guilfoyle and then Nancy Hartley that the college take a leadership role. Um, soon thereafter, Kathy Love um, became a full partner. Blanche Hughes became a full partner in that curriculum infusion project. And then after our first couple of years, the university heard what was going on, and Al Link, the provost at the time, thought, we don't want it stopping in one college. What if we give you more funding and you can broaden it um, to more sectors of the university? After the 10 years, I think we'd involve probably 28 different academic departments on campus. So I think we set quite a ripple effect into motion collectively. 
the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Colorado State University, and that second part is important, really does um, make a difference in the community. Bernard Osher, through the Bernard Osher Foundation, has now funded about 120 of these lifelong learning institutes. Um, they certainly gave us seed money the first few years um, with the promise that there would be a million dollar endowment if the university and if the community showed that it was invested in the project or the program. The institutes have very few requirements from the um, Osher Foundation. One of them is that we are to program for ages 50 and above and that we are to call the institute, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Colorado State University in our institute and that the programmatic offerings would become what the membership wanted, not what the administration thought was appropriate to be offering. So um, the, the institute, I think, is an incredibly important outreach arm of the university. We are part of the Division of Continuing Education Online Plus, but we are the only program, I believe, through that um, entity that really does non-credit courses, short courses. <coughs> and our short courses um, do not carry academic credit. They are just simply designed for the love of learning. Um, at this point at in time, we have 500 community members taking our classes. Um, certainly most of them are in Fort Collins, a strong contingent from Loveland and other parts of Larimer County. There is a great deal of work that goes into planning the offerings for any given term. We have been doing a fall term and a spring term. We have about 30 classes taught by outstanding resources in this community. We were told at the outset by the Osher Foundation, contact some of your best faculty, particularly your best retired faculty, and don't try to define for them a particular course. Ask them what their passion is and would they please teach to their passion. So we uh, took that to heart and even though our teaching base has greatly expanded, we have been so lucky to have the likes of a Lauren Crabtree, a Jim Boyd, a Frank Etheridge, uh, Jerry Johnson, people from across the university teach for us not just once but repeatedly because they like interacting with this age group. It's a group that wants to be taking these classes and the life experiences they bring into the discussions are, are, are exciting and broadening with the professions they've had, the travel experience, the family experience. Classes become richer because of this um, participants who, who take the classes. So we keep minds growing and the Institute also puts a great deal of value in building social relationships. I know personally a number of my really good friends right now are people I had not known before the Osher Institute, la Institute launched. We've been very lucky about the support the university has given us, including Continuing Ed and Hunt Lambert and Lou Swanson, and it's, it's been wonderful working with Jean Morganwick and Bonnie Grantham and a lot of other people. And our members are the ones that have taken over the development of the curriculum, the recruiting of the faculty, the marketing, the planning of the social activities. It's wonderful. Working with Jill Kreitzer to found, or to found a, a model of key advising that really expanded through much of the college. Helping to launch the death, dying, and grief class was really significant to me. The curriculum infusion project, I think, made a difference. Building bridges with uh, Student affairs has always been an important part of what I have done, and I think that with the collaborations of people in student affairs like Jim Cooter and 
Blanche Hughes and Linda Cook and Paul Thayer and Paul Shang and many others, we have really tried to de develop collaborations across entities which should be more integrated than they were 20 or 30 years ago and have become so in a, in a significant way. One really ex good example, I think, is Ram Welcome. And that started, I believe, in the fall of about 2004, and it was launched in terms of initial discussions in my living room in January of that year. We had been charged with developing a much more thorough family-friendly family orientation, and the ideas just kept popping on what we could do for RAM Welcome, both in terms of academics getting a family involved in interacting with one another, and it is built far beyond that in the intervening years since I have retired. But it was exciting, and we had to deal with lots of the mundane, and as well as we had to de deal with the philosophical and the long-reaching. And for some reason, that triggers for me one of the really mundane things that worked out well, probably because of my early Girl Scout years, always have a plan B. And we were in the depths of a drought during that particular summer. Ram Welcome was going to be in the middle of August. I woke up on a Monday, the night of the week it was supposed to start, and I thought, my gosh, what happens if it rains? It had not rained in months, mind you. And I called Blanche and I said, Blanche, we need a rain plan. What if it rains? Well, between Monday and Wednesday, we decided if it rains, we're setting everything up, all these uh, carnival sorts of activities and get acquainted activities on the floor of Moby, not the area back of Lori. And we needed the rain plan. Our hosting the first Ram Welcome broke the drought. And it's like, we do step up to the plate at CSU. We know what to do in a pinch. It played out in that one tiny example in Ram Welcome. And water triggers for me another memory of something that I think I feel good about is how the university came together and survived after the real challenges of the flood. And I think my area in grief and loss probably helped at least some people at the university in that while I was going to meetings on flood recovery, because I was associate dean at the time, and associate deans do those tasks not in one's job description assigned by the dean. And flood recovery wasn't in my job description, but that's what I did with the college for a couple of years. And basically, um, while facilities people were saying, We've got to get these buildings back online. We've got to get rid of the trash. We've got to gut the walls and build new um, configurations so people won't be flooded again. I kept going, what about the people? Don't we care about the people? So there was some tug of war going on between some of us. And finally, I backed off and said, I don't need to be so angry with the people that were, I thought were so worried about the facilities that they couldn't care about the people. I realized they're caring the only way they know how. It is by doing things. I am very good at trying to give the support. And it took both of us and that struggle, I think, to make a difference for the university. So I think that was important to me and um, just many, many other things. And I think something that I have felt so fortunate about in my many years here, between two degrees and my working career, I've been a part of CSU for 42 years. And during those years, I have worked with some of the best of the best. I can't imagine not having the colleagues that I have had um, because so many of them have become friends as well. And I remember clearly many, many, many years ago, my sister who works in banking saying, you have no idea how lucky you are to have spent your life working with friends. It made a difference in my life. We supported one another. We challenged one another. And I've been so lucky to have been married to my husband of many, many years. Ken, with every adventure that was 
offer to me in terms of taking a new job. He always stepped up and said, well, you enjoyed the last one. I think you'll enjoy this one too. Why don't you do it? And um, a lot of women wouldn't have been so lucky in that regard. And for all the joy and all the luck and all the satisfaction, there certainly were some, frustra some frustrating times. And were there things that I wish had been different? Yes, like budget cuts. But CSU knows how to step up because we're committed to the students, we're committed to research programs, and we will do the best we can with whatever resources um, are available. Do I wish some things had turned out differently? Yes. Do, have I gotten frustrated over the years with some students and some colleagues? Absolutely, but now is not the time to talk about those. I am a Pollyanna, but I do have some sense of reality as well. I was hired as an advisor and I was hired as a teacher. And when I look back over the years, I realize that I did not have the skills to be a good teacher at the outset. I hope I grew into a fairly good teacher. I, I think there was a considerable shift over time, so much so that I would love to be able to round up my first couple groups of students and say, could we try this again? I became a much better teacher and I really think I've got more to share and I've got more to draw out of you, which is basically the point. And um, so I saw that shift in myself, um, just be learning more skills, and then certainly built a comfort level over time for the first number of terms, my last stop before going into the bathroom, or excuse me, my last stop before going into the classroom was going into the bathroom because I literally felt sick to my stomach. And I'm glad that dissipated. I wouldn't have stuck it out over so many years. Um, I got to the point where I enjoyed being in front of a group because I felt more comfortable with knowing what I did know and knowing what I didn't know. And I learned very early on it was better to say, I'm sorry, I don't know, but I will try to find out before our next class. And if I can't find out, I'll tell you I don't know and I'll keep looking. Um, that gave me a great comfort, not thinking I had to be the expert in the room at that moment of time. And I also realized that um, as challenging as students could be to me in the classroom, I had no right to show my frustration with certain individuals at that moment in time. I, I remember something my first, second, or third year, some student just kept pushing and wouldn't let something go, and I don't even remember what it was. But I remember leaving the classroom saying, I wish I hadn't said whatever I had said, or I, I wish I hadn't used a particular tone of voice. I can't imagine how that person now feels with an instructor being not as kind as she could have been in that interaction. So I went back into the classroom the next day and said, I want to apologize. I should not have said whatever, done whatever. I really shouldn't have done that, and I'll try not to do anything like that again. I didn't want my students to stop wanting to participate in class. That was the antithesis of what I should have been doing as a faculty member, as a facilitator. Um, I wanted to have high standards for my students, and I remember um, a particular class where I went in and put exams down and said, I don't think you're as bad a class as these exams would indicate to me, and I don't think I'm as bad an instructor as these exams would indicate to me. We have to try this again. So what is it you didn't understand, and let's back out, up and figure out how to go about this differently. I'm getting rid of those grades. My, my goal as a faculty member, and I told this class this, is not to give you a grade at the end of the semester. That's not why I became a teacher. I became a teacher to have you learn something that is important to you. It is not to pass an exam. And that became one of my um, flashpoints is when students would say, well, is this going to be on the exam or what did you get? And it's like, I don't care if it's on the exam and I don't care what you got, you may. I care if you learn something in my class. So there was really a give and take, and I had to learn, I think, processes to be supportive. 
I, I set standards high and would let students within boundaries try something again so that they could become better, they could challenge themselves, and it could make a difference in their profession or their own lives. Um, I know as a faculty, one of my real anger points, and I had few, was students cheating or trying to get away with something. And I was charged as associate dean to develop a first year orientation for all majors in the college so that they would know that there were other departments across the college and they'd come to know something about their own major. So I developed an exercise for students in separate majors to talk about why they believed their faculty had developed a particular curriculum. Why did the occupational therapy faculty include certain courses? Why did the nutrition faculty include certain courses? And so on. Um, I figured for myself and a teaching assistant to do the best job grading that they could, we would first read all of this major's papers, and then we would go to the next department's page papers and the third department's papers and so on. When we broke them down that way, it was fairly easy to tell that there were some duplicate papers in those subsets. I think students had gambled out of a hundred some students, she'll never figure it out, I copied somebody else's paper. In these smaller groups, it was quite easy. So after, at the end of class one day, I said, okay, I want this group of people to stay after class. And when everybody else left the room, I said, now, curiously, every one of you has a paper that looks exactly like somebody else's paper. I wonder how that happened. You can come talk to me as an individual next week, or you can come in with the person whose paper looks remarkably like yours. Every single person came in with the other individual, and I don't know if they collaborated on the paper, one copied the paper or whatever. So I decided I was going to scare the bejimis out of them and basically say, I am putting this in your permanent record and I don't think any record is permanent at CSU. I'm going to put this in your permanent record and if I ever hear of you doing such a thing, you will have consequences. So I don't think you should ever do this again. Do your own work no matter what it is. So I suspect those students learned quite a lesson and I carried that with me that set up some precautions where you know students can't be dishonest. Um, don't give them the temptation, but if you find something going on, have the backbone to do something about it. So um, I, I also, I think as a theme to my teaching, tried to figure out a way that students could apply the knowledge they were learning and um, would often build case study assignments so that they could take the theory, take the research, and try to find a practical solution um, for an issue relevant to that class. So I've certainly enjoyed my teaching career both at the undergraduate and at the graduate levels, and I miss interacting with students.